This is our final sermon from the book of Daniel. We're looking at the last three chapters, Daniel 10, 11 and 12. And why are we looking at three chapters? Because the three chapters together are the fourth and final vision by Daniel. Now in Gen- Daniel chapter 10, it prepares us for the vision. Then in uh, Daniel 11, it gives us the actual vision itself. And then in Daniel 12, it gives us an explanation and insight to what the vision means. Now if we were to pick some key verses from these three chapters... The two I picked is Daniel 10.14. It says, Now I have come to give you understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. So Daniel's obviously not talking about his own time period. He's saying this is in the future. Uh, From the uh, vision, we can tell that it's hundreds of years from Daniel's time. And it's written in Hebrew, not Aramaic, which uh, parts of Daniel was in Aramaic, which is an international language. This is Hebrew, which is saying, this is for God's people. Who are God's people? The Jews. So this is what's going to happen to the Jews in the latter days. And the interesting thing is the uh, Bible has two ways it uses latter days. Latter days can be the destruction of the temple in AD 70, or latter days can be when Jesus returns. The problem that a lot of people get is they'll swap those two events backwards and forwards with different prophecies and uh, can make things quite messy for them. Now the second verse that uh, is tied to this is 12 verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. In other words, uh, Daniel, this is not for your time. This is for a future time. And from our knowledge of the book of Revelation, we know this is the time of Jesus' coming and the destruction of Jerusalem. Now when people see this section, they have a couple of different ways to interpret the vision. Some see that everything is fulfilled with Antioch uh, Epiphanes IV, when he uh, brings about worship of Zeus in the temple. That's about uh, 168 uh, BC, uh, BC. Some will see this, these verses being fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which I think is the most clear one. Others will say, no, Daniel's prophecies are fulfilled throughout the whole of history. And so they love picking on uh, Catholics. And in the early days, they would have said the Turks. And then uh, in more recent uh, centuries, they would have said the Muslims. Others would say, oh, no, Daniel's speaking about now, 2003, our time period. Therefore, you say, oh, there's Donald Trump. There's EU. There's United Nations. And there's a very small group who would say, oh no, this is way in the future, not even our time, don't even think about it, we're we're centuries away from it. So you can see how your presuppositions determine the passage. Today when we come to the passage, I want the passage to interpret the passage, not our presuppositions. So let's, uh, let's go and look at the passage now and see what it says. The first thing is that this vision comes three years into Cyrus's reign. And Cyrus had decreed that the Jews could return to Jerusalem in 538 BC. Now, despite the decree by Cyrus, only about 50,000 Jews returned. A significant amount of the Jewish population in Babylon stayed in Babylon. Only a small number returned. Now, this may be the cause for the next part, which is Daniel is mourning. And he obviously had a sense of the lack of concern that God's people had for doing God's will. They'd become so used to life in Babylon, they had no desire to go back to Jerusalem. And as we reflect on it in modern times, what does it say about our church today, where parts of our church are so in love with the world, they no longer want to be a distinguishing mark of Christ-like behaviour? Now, Cyrus had issued the proclamation about two years earlier. And at this stage, Daniel is possibly over 80 years of age. Now, some people believe that uh, he didn't go back because he was so old. Others believe that maybe he stayed in Babylon because he realised the impact he could make for Jewish people if he was there as an advisor to Cyrus. The Bible doesn't give us a clear answer, so just lets us uh, uh, think what should happen. So let's now turn to uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. There in verse 2, In those days, 
I was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat, and no wine. It goes on and other things that he did not have. And in the end of the three weeks of mourning, he has this uh, vision. So Daniel has a vision of what I call a spiritual man. As we read about the spiritual man, it sounds very much like Jesus. So Daniel would have perceived it possibly as an angel or angelic being. But this is what it says there in chapter 10, verse 6. His body was beryl. His face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And those uh, concepts are captured very nicely for us at the beginning of the book of Revelation as well. There in verse 11 it says this, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. So the vision is very clear, clearly coming to Daniel and say, I have got words of encouragement for you and your people. And then we turn to chapter 11, and here we find Daniel once more gives us a history of the world from his time to around the time of Jesus and the destruction of the Jewish temple. Now, this is not the first time that uh, this, these visions very much follow a very similar pattern, and we've covered them very carefully in earlier sermons. So let's just uh, do a thumbnail sketch there in chapter 11 too. Three more kings shall rise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them, and he shall stir up against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion as he does as he wills. And of course, this is uh, Alexander the Gate. Uh, the kingdom shall be broken and divided into four winds, which is the destruction of uh, after Alexander the Great. Four of his uh, generals took uh, control of four sections. Then it goes into the next lot of battles. Then the king of the south shall have great authority. He describes the prince of the north and the south. Both of those two kingships will fight each other. And it has many chapters of them showing uh, hundreds of years of uh, what would happen. Then in verse 31, Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering as they shall set them up and the abomination that makes desolate. And of course, this is a, a prophecy about Antioch uh, Epiphanes IV. So what did the other prophets at the time of Jesus, as the time of um, Daniel say about these uh, experiences? This is from Jeremiah. It has been made a desolation, a desolation it mourns before me. The whole land has become desolate because no man lays it to heart. Then Jeremiah 18. To make their land a desolation, an object of perpetual hissing. Even who passes by will be astonished and shake his head. Now, the book of Lamentations describes the destruction of Jerusalem after the fall of the temple. Because of Mount Zion, everything will lay in desolation. Or in Ezekiel 30, there will be a desolation in the midst of the desolated lands and her city will be devastated in the midst of devastated cities. So there's a sense that each of the prophets around the time of Daniel describe, uh, sorry, not time of, Daniel, of the time of the destruction, describe the utter, complete desolation of Jerusalem. Now, Antioch Epiphanes has been labelled by some the Antichrist of the Old Testament. Why? Because he put an altar to the god Zeus to be set up in the centre of the Jewish temple. He then went on to uh, sacrifice pigs that he made a soup and broth and forced all the priests to drink the soup broth Pig stuff, which of course was uh, totally foreign and they were not allowed to eat this food. He then sprinkled it over the whole temple. The priestly quarters were turned into brothels. And so everything about the temple had been made into utter distraction. So how does it describe this in Daniel? Verse 32. Talk about Ant Antioch Epiphanes. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. <clears throat> they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help. Now talking about Antioch. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. 
He shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Antiochus is the shadow. Caesar Titus coming, bringing the destruction of Jerusalem, is the final reality. And when we response this, we turn to chapter 12. It says there in verse 1, At that time shall arise Michael, who is the archangel, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been seen since. There was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. First, the Bible tells us that God is in control of all politics and all nations. And this is probably the strongest message to us in Daniel. Yes, disaster is going to happen, but in the midst of disaster, God is still there. and God is still holding on. The second thing is, we find the archangel Michael is fighting and reminds us that you and I are not living in a physical war, but you and I are in the midst of a spiritual war. There's a sense, as you read through the scriptures, that there are demons who have great interest in us, There'll be demons who have interest in our church. There'll be demons who have interest in our region, our suburb, and even demons who have interest at a national and international level. And there is a demonic battle. So when Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 6, he says this, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our battle is a spiritual battle. And probably the most significant place we see that battle is in the life of our, our prayer life as a church and as an individuals. Now when Paul talked about this issue in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and even pretensions that set itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. It's very much saying that uh, our, our core value is found in our holiness. Our core value is found in how we love each other and how we love those in the world. In 1 Peter, it talks about this battle. It says there, in chapter 5, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith. I uh, love my family history. Part of it involves the uh, founding of Tronga Park Zoo. So back in 1916, my family moved the zoo from Moore Park to Tronga Park Zoo and were there till about 1930 running the zoo. And uh, my mother has these great zoo stories. One of the stories is this. My great-grandfather had a Rhodesian Ridgeback dog that he used to use to hunt lions in Africa with. And so they'd go by ship to Africa, they'd get all these animals, and then by ship they'd bring them back again. That's all okay. One day this Rhodesian Ridgeback, this gigantic huge dog, came whimpering into the house, ran in and hid under one of the beds. So they try and drag the dog out, and it runs back under the bed, drag the dog out, and they said, something must have scared the lion, uh, must have scared the, the dog. Let's go outside and have a look. And so into the dark they go, wandering around the zoo with torches trying to find something. The next day they found out the black panther had escaped from its cage. And what are they doing? Stupidly walking around with torches and little kids being out there with torches. What does the Bible say? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, stand firm in the faith. Now, our battle as Christians is not us versus Satan neck and neck as if it's a close battle. Because the opposite to Satan is not Jesus. The opposite to Satan is just another archangel like the archangel Michael. So the book of Romans tells us very clearly there in chapter 8, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We know there is a battle. We know who will win the battle. 
we know that God is on our side and that God will never let us go. Now in the Old Testament, we go to a new section here because the Old Testament is very unclear exactly what happens to people when they die. There's a sense that you die and there is some type of afterlife, but for our large sections, it's not very precise with what occurs. Now when we turn to uh, the next section there in 12 verse 2, it says this, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now sleep is regularly used as imagery for death. And it says, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. Talking about heaven and hell is not popular. I imagine there's many a church where you'd say, when was the last time hell was mentioned? And you'd say, years and years ago. But we need to realise the scripture is very clear and very precise in saying there is a day of judgment. And on that day, each person will be judged according to where they stand with Jesus. And I've just grabbed a couple of New Testament verses. Matthew 10. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Then Matthew 25 to 46. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. And Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 1, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his might. I remember listening to a great uh, commentator who said, uh, all the imagery of fire and flames and burning sulphur is just imagery. And a whole big, oh, phew, fantastic. And it says there's imagery because the reality is far worse. And the part that uh, I wanted to quote two Thessalonians for, it says that the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of God. So what is one of the worst parts of hell? God is not there in his presence. God is not there in his glory. It's the exact opposite of heaven where we will bask in the glory of God and his wonder and his awe and his majesty. And of course, we'll never get bored. I, uh, I love uh, watching the moon rise over the ocean. I've now worked it out. I can go and see the moon. I've seen it rise, I think, four times this year. And I just sit there and I don't care how long it goes for. I just love it. How much more can we spend tens of thousands of years in the presence of God and not be bored one bit. Daniel now goes to another totally new distinct section where he talks about times, times and half a time. It says a, a times, times and half a time and that's when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end. All these things will be finished. Now it's obviously here clearly talking about the Jewish nation. And then in chapter 12 verse 11. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 uh, 1, years. Blessed is he who also waits and arrives at 1,335 years, a difference of 45 days. Now, what is being said here? It's clearly talking about the uh, introduction of... Um, uh, the, the false uh, statues into the temple, the uh, stopping of uh, the sacrifices in the temple, and the abomination of desolation being set up. So we go on to verse 13. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. So end of days is equal to destruction of the temple. The two are linked very strongly together. So what do we have here? First, we have 1,290 days, then 1,335 days. If you go to the book of Revelation, we can add 1,260 days, which represents half of seven years. And sometimes it's described as 42 months. So it's got a number of different ways it's used, and it's used in the book of Revelation and book of Daniel very strongly. Now, it's interesting. This three and a half years signifies the amount of time it took between Antioch Epiphanes coming into Jerusalem and him finishing up and it's the same amount of time as uh, when Caesar Titus organises his Roman soldiers to attack Jerusalem 
to the destruction of the temple. Both those two periods of time are three and a half years. Now, what is one of the troubles that you and I now have of trying to pinpoint accurately what those dates mean? What part of the three and a half years, what happened when? First of all, we have only a little bit of historical knowledge. There's a guy called Josephus, and uh, there's some books called Maccabees in the Catholic Bible that talk about these events, but they're not enough material for us to do accurate date stamping. Now, there's some other vague references there, but uh, not enough to really be uh, precise in what we want to try and pick. What we do know, it is talking about the destruction of Antioch, Epiphanes. It is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. So that is very, very clear. So when we go back to Daniel 12, verse 1, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So you say, when Zeus's statue was set up in the temple, Nothing in Israel had ever happened as bad as that. But then you come to the destruction of the temple and the Romans coming into power and that is seen as equal devastation. So we have these two events there. But uh, verse 6 gives us some insight. How long shall be till the end of these wonders? Now, some would say this is the temple being destroyed. Others would say, no, this is the day Jesus returns. So you can see where the conflict comes. Now, as I said, the last couple of chapters of Daniel are in Hebrew. It is written for Jewish people, and it clearly states often that it's talking about Jewish events of destruction. So the clearer way to view this is it's really focusing on the destruction of Jerusalem, not the return of Christ. Now, where is it most difficult? When people try and work out the date starting and ending, the three and a half years, is it when Antioch Epiphanes or Caesar arrives at Jerusalem? Is it when they uh, conquer Jerusalem? Is it when the statues are set up on the temple? Is it when the temple sacrifices are stopped? So which of those four dates would you pick as your starting point? And then the ending, do you pick the death of Antioch Epiphanes? Do you pick uh, the, uh, the, the cessation of the attack? What dates do you pick? You can see why there's difficulty in trying to be too precise with these things. And sadly, there's a whole lot of people who love being too precise. Now, the other interesting thing is a number of the people I, I read for this passage would regularly quote Jesus as that no man knows the hour and no man knows the day of Jesus' return. And they'd start with that in their very first sentence. And then the rest of their article would be saying, but I know the date. As if, you know, Jesus doesn't know, but I know something that Jesus doesn't know. Now, what makes it more complex for you and I? In Matthew 24, Jesus refers to the abomination of desolation as a future event. Yes, it had happened in Antioch Epiphany's time. But Jesus is looking to say, that's what happened then will happen again in AD 70. Now, what does uh, Daniel teach us? It says that you and I as Christians will face persecution. You and I will go through difficult times. As believers, there are times the world will love us. And at other times, we will be treated as despised outcasts. I have a lovely friend of mine who is a Salvation Army officer, as was his father and grandfather. And he talks about his grandfather regularly would be beaten up in pubs when he arrived as a Salvation Army officer at the pub. And you and I say, who could ever beat up a salvo? They're lovely people in their uniforms. But a past generation of Australians did. Now, do believers today face difficulties? Many believers in, are in countries where it is hard. With things like Bible ownership, is difficult. If you're in North Korea, you are punished possibly by death or imprisonment for owning religious books or even a Bible. Now, China allows Bibles for churches who are part of the Three Self Patriotic Movement, but you cannot order Bibles by mail order by individuals, and if you're an unregistered church, you cannot order a Bible. Now, if you go to Morocco, they allow Bibles but only in French, English and Spanish and not in Arabic, the language of the people of Morocco. In uh, Turkmenistan, for instance, they don't allow Bibles to be published in the country but allow you to import them. 
Now, Ian, for your benefit here, Gideon's International are not allowed to operate in Afghanistan, Algeria, China, Comoros, Djibouti, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Maldives, Mediterranean, Morocco, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Tunisia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Yemen. They've been banned. But some other Bible societies are allowed to offer, operate in some of those countries. All up, there are 52 countries in the world that have some level of limitation on Bible distribution in the world. Now, there's only about 200 countries in the world. So one in four countries limit Bibles. There are numerous countries where churches have been forbidden to be built. Now, Open Doors has a, a ratings. They have nine countries where they say persecution is extreme. 15 very high and another 25 countries which are described as being high. Now, Open Doors, Open Doors one of their articles says, tens of thousands of Christians are incarcerated in horror labour camps and thousands more kept their faith in Christ a complete secret often from their own family members, do not even know of their faith for the fear of the repercussions. In Somalia, which ranks second for persecution, the charity says people who are even suspected of being a Christian can be murdered on the spot. Now, the militant Islamic group, uh, Al Shirab, which is very highly active in that part of the world, has made a uh, promise that Somalia will be free of all Christians is their aim. When a friend of mine worked out there years and years ago, at that time it was believed there was 120 Christians. And uh, there's a delightful story that uh, one of the other missionaries who worked with some of the people there um, went back to Kenya because he's not allowed back into Somalia because of, of the danger. And he uh, was in one of the refugees camps in Kenya. And this group of people came and said, we have been praying and fasting for your return. We wanted to see you. And it was some of the Christians from Somalia that he'd ministered with. And uh, he spent two or three days of great encouragement and joy with these people. And Somalia had got so bad, they had escaped to Kenya. So what is Daniel teaching us here? What's the big, big picture of Daniel? The first is that God is in sovereign control. When we think things are falling apart in our life, God is in the midst of each of those events. Secondly, a lot of our battle is not physical. It's not the world. But it's a spiritual battle that we are fighting against. That Satan is trying uh, method after method to cause us havoc. Third, we're told that prayer is a key weapon for us as believers. It's our spiritual warfare that Satan fears most. We're also told that hard, hard times may come. But you and I need to respond to hard times by being holy as he is holy. And of course, the last thing we find here in Daniel is that Jesus will return. And no man knows the hour and no man knows the day. But we are called to be holy, righteous, set apart and godly for his will and his purpose. Amen. Let's finish in prayer. Father God, Daniel has been a powerful book that encourages us and reminds us of who you are. Father God, teach us to be holy as you are holy. Amen.